Hello Warfighters, War is Hell. Welcome to the next episode of the Military Lecture Series that I'm doing as part of some university research. Today we're going to be answering the question, how did Soviet military strategy evolve? Before we get into that, I want to thank everybody who's helping me out with this project, whether it's liking the video, subscribing to the channel, or if you're commenting below and letting me know some of the things that you've learned, that's actually really, really cool because there's, we've seen some really, really good comments in the comment section, so please keep that up. Of course, a big thank you to everybody who's helping support financially as well. Uh, whether it's through Patreon or a one-time donation, that money is going to help out with tuition, textbooks, and other things pertaining uh, to my education and some of the research that we're, we're doing here. So any donation that you guys can give it will be a huge help. All of that is in the description below. For today's episode, we're going to be looking uh, at two different sources here, the first of which is the book Soviet Military Strategy in Europe by Joseph D. Douglas Jr. We're also going to be looking at chapter five of the book Getting Mad, Nuclear Mutual Assured Destruction, Its Origins and Practice. This chapter was written by John A. Uh, Badalega, and it basically references some work that uh, John Hines had done with some Soviets after the fall of the Cold War. He interviewed a number of them, I believe 22 was the number to really get an idea of how the Soviet Union uh, had thought about their military, their nuclear weapons and things like that, and kind of tying that to what the West believed. It's very interesting, but we'll be talking actually a lot from that book for this episode and also the next one. So I'm very excited about that. Okay, now let's go ahead and get started. Changes in Soviet military science really happened in phases. This is something I've been able to find from a number of sources here, and we've kind of talked a little bit about this already. In particular, in the last episode, we talked about how in the 50s, the use of nuclear weapons was really introduced into the Soviet military strategy as the number of nuclear weapons and the sheer power of nuclear weapons continued to increase. In the 60s, we also saw that there was revisions to the role of tanks in the field and also uh, a look at how the centralization of forces and leadership would kind of go. But nothing in these changes that we see take place was nearly as big as the advent of nuclear weapons. And this really guides a lot of Soviet military thinking uh, from the 40s onward. And you'll see how this evolves uh, over time as we'll be focusing on that particular period, the post-World War II onto the end of the Cold War. Because uh, for the Soviet Union, they wanted to have this superiority in military and, and techni uh, technical ability. And of course, nuclear weapons were going to be a big part of that. And so there's a lot of focus that is there. So let's get to the first phase here that we're going to be talking, which uh, takes place from 1946 to 1953. A quick review here is that the Soviet Union had actually started developing nuclear weapons in 1942, but after... World War II, they really didn't do that much as far as nuclear weapon production, uh, research, uh, as, as much as took place in the West, I should say. It, the, the Soviet Union basically at this time went in more to a lesson learned phase. So they were reviewing a lot of what happened in World War II and trying to see, okay, what went well there? What do we need to change? So that way this doesn't happen again and a number of other things. They're incorporating a lot though from German scientists uh, various rocket technicians and they were analyzing uh, a number of, of aspects for rocketry but this was kind of uh, kind of the main focus here in the book the development of soviet military science after world war ii it says in the first post-war period the development of soviet military theory predominantly proceeded along the traditional path of generalization and analysis of the experience of the past war of working out on this basis conclusions and recommendations for the conduct of armed conflict by ordinary or conventional means what we learn here from uh, the work of Heinz here, it says that Soviet strategy emphasized the use of massive conventional armored land forces to obtain a, a three to six fold advantage over the opposing forces and to defeat them with rapid, decisive offensive ground operations. Now, of course, this isn't anything different than we had seen before. This offensive push is obviously a big part of military of Soviet military doctrine. But the fact that conventional means was really the way that the Soviet Union saw things were going to be going up until 1953 is pretty interesting. But what changed was the death of Stalin. So when Stalin dies and Khrushchev eventually takes over, this is where we see the biggest change taking place. 
Uh, this was likely a, a very chaotic time, though, after the death of Stalin because of so much that was changing and how everything had kind of been built around Stalin. Um, Douglas, uh, the author of one of the books that we're referencing here today, says it took about a year to break loose from the previous period and to change the way of thinking following the death of Stalin. Uh, he goes on to say that it may not have been totally changed, though, until 1961 course Stalin really had a lot of things in place that would have to change but looking at 1954 to 1961 the emphasis was really made to look towards the future and a complete rethink of Soviet military science to include nuclear weapons and how they were going to be delivered to the enemy. Uh, this was a lot in part because of the hydrogen bomb being developed. Again, it was the sheer number and the sheer power of nuclear weapons that really forced a change. And really, um, the diversity in how they could be delivered also gave another reason for the Soviet Union to think about how uh, they were going to go ahead and use it and how central it would be to their military. The Penkovsky Papers says, In 1958, a seminar discussion began in the general staff on problems of military art in a future war. All high-ranking officers from Army commanders on up, representative of all arms of troops, participated in these seminars. The seminars were of a secret nature, and the con uh, conversation and discussion that took place there must not be revealed to any outsiders. The basic questions discussed were those of a future war in the state of Soviet military art. By 1959, all the top military brains of the general staff agreed that the Soviet military doctrine needed to be revised. Future strategy must be developed on the basis, first of all, on the availability of nuclear weapons and missiles. So this major shift here that we're seeing in the 50s uh, is really going to be a core concept of the Soviet military for years to come. In December of that same year, 1959, that's when we start to see the Strategic Missile Force to be formed. Uh, a month later, a new military doctrine was announced. Now, the Strategic Missile Force was its own separate branch of the military, focused, of course, particularly on nuclear weapons and other important uh, areas around that as well. The Soviets point uh, to this particular moment as the real start of the modern era of the Soviet military science uh, in the, the book development of Soviet military science, it says its main content, the recognition of nuclear weapons as the chief means of combat. This is huge. The chief means of combat, meaning nuclear weapons, is very telling on how the Soviet Union thought a war with the West would go and uh, is a core component, of course, of their thinking. Originally, the Soviet Union viewed nuclear weapons as anti-city weapons and under Khrushchev, uh, that would be their central weapon of war. Uh, from what I've been able to find in a couple places here is uh, originally the Soviet Union just thought of the nuclear weapon as another step up in the type of bombs that could be delivered and not quite as central as this being their chief means of combat. So that was pretty interesting from my standpoint, but I can see how they quickly evolved after uh, the hydrogen bomb and larger, uh, larger blast radius and things like that uh, had to be taken into account. Now the period from 1960 to 1965 saw the development of nuclear weapons as the primary weapon of war as we talked about, uh, even going so far as to sacrifice in some cases the development and construction of some conventional weapons. So that's how important it was to them. According to a number of interviews done by high-ranking figures in the former Soviet Union, uh, this is what we've been able to find out, and again, this goes back to, to Heinz and some of the research that he did. He said a key to this strategy was the assumption that the U.S. opponent could be preemptive from using nuclear weapons. The comparatively, or comparatively low level of missile technology placed a high premium on preemption because the time required to fuel the missiles and attach their warheads made a retaliatory meeting strike um, impossible and a purely retaliatory strike highly unlikely so that was a big part of how the Soviet Union was going to be implementing nuclear weapons here during this time and of course part of their their thinking this phase on nuclear development and nuclear almost obsession brought a real revolution in every aspect of Soviet military thinking and how they would wage war Joseph D. Douglas Jr. in 1980 said that this period is the most significant phase in understanding Soviet military doctrine military science in Soviet military affairs. So this is something that we cannot gloss over. We have to go into some detail on, which is why this in the next episode will kind of be largely talking about some of this.
The revolution in the military field has taken place uh, not only in the field of material means of waging war, but also in the realm of ideas. It has required a radical review of existing military theoretical views, a working out of new principles of military science, and a thorough development of all its constituent parts and branches on a new basis. This comes from the development of military science. All of this was very different than the way that the U.S. had thought about nuclear weapons. Uh, for the most part, the U.S. shied away from the use of nuclear weapons when possible. Uh, the most well-known example of this is during the Korean War when General MacArthur called for the use of atomic weapons specifically to contain the Chinese. In addition, uh, compared to the USSR, the US didn't invest nearly as much in the technological advancement and development of nuclear weapons as the Soviet Union did at some points in time. Douglas states that the US saw that the atom bomb is kind of more of a uh, more powerful uh, than others but a tool in their overall arsenal whereas the ussr saw this as the weapon of war so that is the big difference of what we're seeing between the west and the ussr it wasn't until the next phase though 1965 to 1975 that the soviet union and khrushchev began to really underestimate how useful uh, or they began to to properly understand how useful nuclear weapons would be and their ability to eliminate a retaliatory strike from the U.S. Because as we talked about earlier, the the ability for the Soviet Union to have a preemptive strike to take out the United States' uh, ability to respond diminishes, of course, over time. Now, during this particular phase, uh, an entire review was done of the Soviet military to look at it. Uh, not only as a whole, but to come to a decision about how everything, including conventional weapons, would be used. So we see somewhat of a drawback from seeing the nuclear weapon as the primary weapon of war. That doesn't mean that it is no longer the primary weapon of war, but the Soviet Union begins to understand that conventional is going to be a an important tool for them to use. Going from a different philosophy on how the, the platforms for delivering nuclear weapons had changed, uh, are shifting in the Soviet Union during this particular phase, they start thinking rather than going from just one massive strike to accomplish their goal to maybe a series of strikes to accomplish their task, uh, knowing that NATO might be trying to do the same and try to limit the amount of nuclear weapons that would be used. Uh, as we talked about here, the, the changes that are taking place with delivery and other things as well, the most substantial of which here is uh, submarines now being able to... Uh, launch nuclear weapons as well. This allowed the Soviet Union to recognize that if they were to go ahead and launch a strike on the United States and the West, they would not be able to launch a strike without being hit to some degree themselves. And this is uh, one of the big things that causes this shift. During 70 to 75, the USSR for the first time implements a policy to look towards a controllable nuclear war, basically looking at things uh, taking place maybe at a more regional level as far as a nuclear strike as opposed to something a lot more massive being the only option. In some cases, we've been able to see that the Soviet Union saw that just one massive strike was all it was going to take and that's all that the war would be. 70 through 75, things change. Now, uh, what we saw from the Soviets, uh, the former Soviets that were interviewed, for John Heim, and this is going outside of the area that we kind of been focusing on in uh, the book by Joseph D. Douglas Jr. because it's written in 1980. We can't really go past uh, this particular point. Uh, but when we take a look at the final stage here, 75 uh, to 91, this is where the Soviets started to believe that a totally convention, uh, conventional war was in fact possible in uh, to a large degree should be the preferred method of warfare. Massive and smaller scale nuclear strikes were still practiced and they were still in the Soviet playbook, but they would need to be used as a defensive means, which aligned more with the policies and practices that were used in the West. So a lot of things changed here over these different periods, as you can see, leading us from, well, nukes aren't important, nukes are the most important thing, to close to the end of the Cold War, which is if war breaks out, let's try and keep it as conventional as possible. These particular periods, as we see some shifts take place, is very interesting because especially in the, the uh, first two phases changing because of the change in leadership, we could see some of this take place uh, down the road as well. And in some cases, it's like 
here is this business and a CEO takes over and completely changes everything. So these, uh, while evolutionary in some of these cases, it also kind of set back the Soviet Union quite a bit because they had pre uh, prepared so long for one type of warfare and then it had to go back and change to something else. So this has been very, very interesting to go ahead and take a look at and review how some of these changes took place. So I definitely recommend going in, uh, reading some of the stuff that I've got here. For example, uh, the book Soviet Military Strategy in Europe, the link to where you can purchase that is in the description below. And I will also include a link to Getting Mad, Nuclear Mutual Assured Destruction, Its Origins and Practice. In the comment section, let me know if you learned something here or what you found to be the most interesting. I'd love to hear what you guys are enjoying from some of these videos that I'm putting together. Of course, like the video if you enjoyed what you saw. Subscribe for more of this because I'm going to try and uh, pump these out just about every Monday and Friday. But real life happens like I wasn't able to post one on Monday because school was starting and I had to focus on that. But really, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. War is hell. You don't have to worry because warfighters, I've got your six.